Right, in the last video I introduced you to this Zonti ZT350T that I bought for four grand. And now I wanna show you the good and the bad of how it's put together. This is future me to say that this video is sponsored by Kalimoto and I'll tell you why later. Now as I record this, which is only two days since I shot the last video, I've done just over 800 miles on the Sontis in total. Now check out that other one if you haven't seen how I bought it undercover because the idea is to find out what it's like for anyone to own and live with a Chinese bike like this, not just what it's like for a journalist to borrow one. And if you want to keep up to date or ask anything about it, join the Bike Social team on our Facebook group. So yeah, it's in bits. I've stripped it down as far as I could and I did want to take all the headlamp assembly apart but I just couldn't work out how to get to it. It looks like it might be easy to access if I take the front end off but I don't want to do that just yet. But anyway, let's jump straight in with what's good about this. Oh, and again, I'll treat you to some of those Chinglish pearls of wisdom from the instructions. I want to say that I'm impressed with how the fasteners are all pretty consistent in size, having stripped this down. My old CBR 600s, though granted they were old, they were an FM, an FT and an FX, they had what seemed like a different screw for each hole. It was a right pain in the arse, you had to kind of label every one of them. I'm also surprised to find a lot of them having uh, spacers and rubber washers attached. It's just little extras that add a little to the production cost. So stripping it was fine, really. I struggled with the tank covers until I realized that they come off with the tank. Then would be easy to take, take off. I was trying to get access to them and getting really annoyed with it, but then realized I didn't need to do it while they were there. The thing is the instructions tell you how to remove the tank, but they make no sense at all. So I just had to work it out for myself. And the tank's said to be galvanized steel, so shouldn't have any rust issues, but what I really appreciate is the quick release connector underneath the tank. Now, that's common on bikes now, but I half expected to find a normal hose on there with fuel pouring out everywhere, like on my ZX6. There's the main fuel pipe, uh, electrical connector for the pump, two more connectors on the other side, and the breather pipe to disconnect, then it lifts off. And while we're talking about rust proofing, the um, collector box on here cleaned up nice. It's stainless steel, stainless steel exhaust, so that should last well. And looking under where the tank was, we can also see the Bosch ABS pump with the braided brake lines all neatly rooted to it. There's quite a few of these push pin fasteners, but they, they work fine. Push the center in, which I know seems weird. By pushing it in, that pushes that pin to the back. And now, obviously, you wouldn't normally be able to get to the back on a lot of these. So then you want something that won't scratch the plastic, but you just slip under the clip. There we go. Sometimes you can get the V under it. And then the pin just pulls out and that's it. Now to put it back, you push it back through like that and then you can insert it. And then when you push the pin in, you see it splays out that bit. And yeah, the, the ABS plastic seem quite resilient. I've had Japanese bikes in the past that have appeared more brittle than this when taking panels off and they have, I've cracked clips off of those. But even when I was trying to get the um, top of the uh, tank off and making a ham-fisted attempt of it. It popped off without breaking, so yeah, seems fine. The crash bars had to come off to get the plastics off the sides, which might mean the lamps are gonna be a bit more of a challenge to wiring, so I like to tuck everything out of the way. Um, but they seem solid, being two millimeter thick steel. They're held securely at the bottom and at the top under the tank, but at the front, they're gripped with like rubber covers over them, so that means they can't transmit any load from one side to the other in a full like it does on my GS. Of course, that's a much heavier bike and maybe this is designed to absorb some of the impact. They're certainly not cosmetic crash bars, but I was surprised they weren't like kind of locked together at the front. As I say though, that might be a specific choice as it's all very solid part of the frame under there. The USB accessory port that's on the inside left of the fairing, that's connected with an open back connector. And by that I mean you can kind of see the wires, but it's well protected under the covers here. Uh, the point is, what I like is that most of the other connectors on here are sealed. They're quite small ones, and there's a lot of these little connectors, rather than using custom connectors, I guess that keeps it cheaper, but they are sealed. The cables are also really well rooted, uh, with either clipped into some of the plastics, uh, or strapped down with um, Velcro straps. And one of those straps broke, but it is good to see the cables being fairly well controlled in this. On the sides here, these connections are all 
kind of under the seat and in the side panels. I actually found the diagnostics port finally, uh, and there are loads of connectors and relays under here. I did notice some moisture in one of these, um, but only within the like the rubber shield, uh, and I think that was from when I was washing it. So just bear that in mind if you're spraying a jet wash in there. Uh, it, it, certainly the water won't get trapped in there. The only place I did find water trapped was on the front here, and it's foamy water, so no, that was from the cleaning last night. The bolt had a little bit of rust on it, on the thread, but that's more to do with it being exposed underneath the nose. Keeping in mind I sprayed this with XCP when I got it, I've been riding it through the worst weather we've had through January, including Storm Hank, and there's been some serious salt built up on these oil cooler pipes. The heat certainly hasn't helped here, but there is some marring to the surface. And I should say the, the lorries have been gritting pretty well every night round here, so it's no surprise, and really I should have been keeping this more rinsed off, but I didn't have time and that's the reality. Honestly though, that marring is no different to what I've seen on Japanese bikes and otherwise it's been pretty well fine so far. And another place I did see some rust is on one fastener on the screen, but I'll come to some other corrosion issues later. On that screen though, there's custom molded rubber panels under it where it could have been just basic rubber washers. The fixing all seems a little bit ill thought out, being a cover screwed on top of the fasteners, but it works fine. I forgot to mention in the last video about this little storage box under the clocks. It's not big enough for my large phone, but you could put some change in here or a toll card perhaps or something like that. It's set into this cast aluminium top piece which carries the dash and the screen. I was expecting the screen motor to be a bit Heath Robinson looking, but it all seems quite tidy. Apart from this controller, which is loose in here weirdly, it's it's not flapping around crazily, but it just, just seems odd that it's not kind of fastened in there somehow, but it's secure enough. Going back to the other end, the battery is surprisingly large. It, uh, it's long, but kind of narrow. I talked about that though in the last video. Something I did like though is that while there are three separate fuse boxes and they're just loose under the seat they all have spare fuses on the back of them which is a neat touch. Here's the uh, release mechanism so if we have a look up here and latch the seat down all it is is a solenoid here so as that solenoid pulls in it releases. Have a look up here solenoid's pulled in releases so, in a very worst case scenario, it, you could drill a hole in the underbody, under panel, for a screwdriver to press that, or you could flick it here. At the back here, I was really surprised to find these rubber bungs in the ends of the subframe. When I went on the launch at the first Ducati Scrambler, which was a long time ago, I commented that these tubes on there were open and vulnerable to getting crap down them, so despite these ones being hidden under the bodywork, it's a nice touch to have them plugged. Again, it costs a tiny amount to do, but every little tiny thing adds up, so it's good to see on something so budget. I guess really, like, the electrics seem Okay, obviously I talked in the last video about an issue I had. I think it's clear that some money seems to be being saved by using generic connectors and lots of them, rather than more specific larger connectors that carry a lot in one go. But overall, I'm fairly impressed with this so far. For normal maintenance, obviously you don't need to do any of this apart from one side panel to get the air filter out. And the oil filter cartridge is easily accessible. Also, there are torque settings in the instructions, so while Zontes really should have invested a small amount of money in having someone properly translate that manual, it's all looking pretty good, except. <music> At 500 miles, I noticed that the paint was wearing off the frame where my heel was rubbing. It's disappointing, but not unusual, really. Heel guards on bikes usually wear, or there's sometimes a plastic protector fed. More concerning is that there are some small areas of the frame that seem to have little gaps in the paint. I'll keep an eye on these as they could see corrosion start there and then spread and bubble the pa under the paint. Just have to keep an eye on it. That's why I've got this for a year, see what happens. A little thing, but these rubber spaces under the seat kept falling off, so I glued them on. This is what really shocked me though. So I've just disconnected the connector here. This seems to be the Bosch fuel injection system. So this wasn't fastened at all. It was just rattling around loose in here. Let's see here. It's a Bosch Motronic, made in China. 
Uh, so that's the fuel injection system. But look at this. I assume this is a grounding wire, and I wonder if this is what was causing the dump sensor signal voltage too low warning. Should that be touching and grounded on there properly? If that disconnects, could that be what's causing the problem? I don't know, but I'm going to have to take this bottom shroud off because surely this should be fixed to the bike, not just rattling around loose. I did take the shroud off, but it didn't help. And there's nowhere that this should be screwed under. It's, it's not been missed to screw under and there's no fastenings and none of the holes line up. Could drill them. I, mm, no, <laughs> it's under warranty. I'm not going to mess about with that. So I tried using a nut and bolt to fasten the cable to the body of the EFI ECU, but then it wouldn't fit back in the gap. So in the end, I had to use a rivet and then file that down to get it as thin as I could. And I still had to drop the inner tray down to jiggle it in. And it's still not held in place. It still moves under there, but it's back where it was. But at least now the wire is pretty secure. It's not quite as tight as I'd have liked, but it is held there properly and doesn't appear that any crap is getting under there. Something I just noticed here, the plug isn't properly sealed. And looking inside, it does seem to have moisture in there. But I'm going to poke that down with a screwdriver because I'm not happy about that. More irritating than a real problem is the accessory connector. The instructions say it's on the left of the bike and shows a picture of the left as we surely all think of it, left as you sit on it but this is on the inside of the right hand panel. Still, you can get to it without stripping the bike and the tails are sealed and then were taped out of the way. So all nice touches really. And it is a waterproof connector. And this is where I'll power the accessories from. Okay, this should have been the bit where I talked about the accessories. It's three weeks since I shot that last clip and the bike's now done 1,117 miles. But I've got an update on the bad. Actually, I reckon it's fair to say the ugly of this bike. That loose EFI ECU and zip-tied grounding cable, I think just aren't acceptable. And a big thanks especially to Nick Barfield on the Bike Social Facebook group who did a lot of digging trying to find out if there was a missing bracket under here, but there's not. I got in touch with Bosch who'd been really helpful and spoke to a UK engineering manager. He contacted Bosch's two-wheeler and power sports divisions in China and Germany and was able to tell me that the MSE6 ECU here was developed and is supplied by UAES or United Automotive Electronic Systems Co Limited, which was established as a joint venture between Zhonglian Automotive Electronics Co Limited and Robert Bosch in 1995. So it's confirmed that this is a Bosch developed fuel injection ECU and also that it's supplied to Zontes on its own, not with the wiring harness, foam pads, or that wire and ring connector. So knowing that, and given all the other bikes I've stripped down over the years, I'd be amazed if this unit was designed to be fitted, rattling around loose like this. Given the foam tape that wasn't Bosch original fitment, and the fact that there's nowhere on the frame for this to bolt into, it doesn't seem to be just a one-off that was missed in the factory. But I need to do some more digging. Anyway, in the 300 plus miles I've ridden since the last video, I haven't had the dump sensor warning come on. So it's either the replacement sensor that sorted it or the grounding issue on that ECU that I fixed. I'd be interested to hear from anyone else who's had that warning light come on. So please let me know in the comments. And of course, tell me what you think of the bike so far. And while you're there, if you're enjoying this series, please do hit the like button as it really helps. And don't forget to tap subscribe if you wanna see the next one. I'm sure you wanna watch this on a dyno. Now I mentioned those small connectors used in the bike. While they are sealed, I think they're just too small to use on a motorbike. And while disconnecting the keyless ignition antenna, I accidentally pulled the wires out of its connector. Now that's my fault, but I am disappointed with how easily they came out. Rather than solder the wires permanently together, I did manage to get the connector apart and solder the wires back in. But the thing is, while I was working on the bike with that off, I noticed that as long as the fob has power and it's quite near the bike, the antenna isn't needed. And over the last few weeks riding it, I found that the range is really low now. So I bought some new batteries thinking it was that, but it's not. And having just tested it again, I can see that the antenna is doing nothing. I can just unplug it and it's the same result. The signal's being picked some up somewhere else. Problem is that if I take the battery out of the fob or if the battery goes flat, there's no way to start the bike now as the antenna, antenna definitely isn't working and it's needed for that 
no power start. Now I've checked for continuity and the antenna isn't open circuit, so I'm sure that's all still correct. So I'm wondering if I've left a connection off somewhere, maybe where the cable disappears up under the tank panels. I'll strip it down again and check, as all I can do for now is make sure I always have a spare battery and hope the fob doesn't fail. Or there's something else gone wrong. I'll let you know in the next video how I get on. Now before we look at the accessories I've fitted and why some of them were absolutely essential, I wanted to thank Kalimoto for sponsoring this video. Now I don't usually do sponsorship as all of my reviews are completely independent and unbiased. But when Kalimoto asked about getting involved in some of my content, I figured it could help towards paying for this bike. So what is Kalimoto? Well, they say it's your all-in-one motorcycle tool for the best rides where you can find and plan routes, navigate them and track your adventures. I say it's one of the best apps I've ever used and has absolutely changed the way I ride. Let's say you've got a free afternoon. I like to open the app, set a round trip of, I don't know, 100 miles, then I just let it do its thing. You can tell it what direction you want to head and you can reshape the route, but I've honestly discovered so many fantastic roads, even quite close to where I live, that this is one of my favorite ways to get around. You can use it for destinations too. Those rides will usually take a fair bit longer than if you're just using Google Maps, but I can pretty much guarantee there'll be a lot more fun. You can really easily plan routes in as much or as little detail as you want on your phone, a tablet, or on the web-based app on a Mac or PC. And I, I don't know how the algorithm works, but it's always proven way more fun than anything Garmin's adventurous routing or TomTom's winding routes can do. But don't take my word for it. You can try a basic version for free right now by going to Kalimoto.com. Or better still, you can use all of the features for absolutely nothing for 30 days with the code BIKESOCIAL30. Use that when you sign up. And if you don't like it, just cancel the subscription and you'll not be charged. I'd never recommend anything I didn't completely believe in myself. So if you love exploring back roads, I reckon it's well worth a go. And if you're already a Kalimoto user, let us know in the comments below what you think. Okay, let's have a look at these accessories. Obviously, we've got this Shad SH44 top box. I love a top box because I can do so much more with a bike from grabbing some shopping to using it to stow my kit when I've stopped. This one costs £122.99 for the top box and plate, plus £42.99 for the fitting kit for this bike. Now there are loads of different size boxes and panniers available, plus all the fitting kits for hundreds of different bikes at shad.co.uk. This one seemed a good size to me without dwarfing the bike. I've had no problem with handling, of course, and it's a handy backrest for my wife too when she comes out. Uh, you've probably noticed the RNG swing arm bobbins that make lubing the chain a lot easier, plus the C-Tech charging lead. But I've also got the Chiggy AIO5 Lite fitted now. I'll be doing a full review of this, of course, but it's basically an Android Auto or Apple CarPlay device that displays apps from your phone on its screen. Now, unfortunately, Kalimoto doesn't support these types of devices yet, but hopefully that'll get sorted soon. I've been using it with Google Maps to either get from A to B or just have the map open to keep an eye out for interesting looking roads. It's also a dash cam with a front and rear camera. And the footage is okay, but like other dash cams, it's not up to action camera standards and it's a faff to get the clips off. So I wouldn't buy this thinking you'll use it to share fun videos of all your rides. It does have a blind spot warning system built in that alerts you to vehicles coming up behind you or to the side, which does work really well, though only on clear days. In bad weather or at night, the cameras film fine, but don't see the other vehicles. And the hardware buttons on the top are really handy and I'm very impressed with how even in heavy rain, you don't get false inputs from the touchscreen like you do on a phone. Though the on-screen buttons are pretty small while you're looking at the map, which can make using it with winter gloves a bit awkward and you do need gloves that are designed for a touchscreen. Besides the cameras and small GPS antenna, there's nothing else to tuck away on the bike, which is handy as I honestly don't think I'd have been able to get a normal dash cam control box anywhere under the seat of this bike. Thing is, all the cables are hardwired into the cheeky. cheeky chiggy so that means you can't remove the unit when you park up it's fixed on with security fasteners but my worry is coming back and finding it hanging off the bracket after some scrotes had a go now i've got the tire pressure monitors and remote control too but haven't fitted them yet 
Watch out for a big video I'm working on that compares all the pros and cons of the navigation devices you might want to consider, including your phone, Beeline, Garmin, TomTom, this, and ruggedized tablets. Overall, so far, this is a really good bit of kit that does a lot for the money, but there's a few little niggles that I wanna dig into a bit more. You can also get it in the UK now, rather than importing it, as a bike thing stocks them. Right, the absolute essentials. At the rear, the tail lights are a bit hidden by the luggage rack, even before I put the top box on. So I fitted these Oxford run lights, which give me a hell of a lot more confidence than that I'll be seen. And at the front, I've put the Oxford auxiliary lights on, as the standard headlight is dangerously terrible. I had to ride on main beam all the time after nearly crashing on an unlit back road. I'm not exaggerating there. But look at this footage. This road's okay as it's got warning signs, but still, look how you can see bugger all as I tip it. Now look at the same corner with the Oxford lights on. This is the kind of spread I get in my car and it's so much safer. The diffusion on them works well and though it does depend on how you position them, they don't seem to be annoying drivers coming the other way, especially as I only need to use main beam now when I want to see right down the road. And these lights retail at £229.99 though I've seen them for less sometimes and the run lights on the back are £49.99 so I reckon spending an extra £270 on this bike was something I had to do because without them it just didn't feel safe to ride at night. Now while I've been talking I've been running the names of all the people who very kindly donated to one of Bennett's charity partners this year, Magpass Air Ambulance, which provides vital life-saving support to thousands of ill or seriously injured people across 12 counties. Every two years, Bennett's pairs up with two different charities and matches all the donations up to £2,500 each year for each charity. So that's up to ten grand in total, generously added to everything we can raise. Our other charity partner over the next two years is the incredible Coventry Haven Women's Aid. I'll leave links in the description if you'd like to know any more. Now don't forget, I've got a dino video of the Zontis coming up. I've got Helen's Pillion Opinion and a lot more, including my two and a half thousand mile ride to southern Spain. So until next time, whatever you're riding and wherever you're going, enjoy the adventure and I'll see you soon. Yeah.